online course. It is Holy Week, and we've only got three days uh, this week before Easter, uh, at least before uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, then Easter, and then we have the next two days off, uh, Monday and Tuesday. So if you didn't get the email, uh, we have Tuesday uh, off as well now. So in order to make the calendar kind of work and not end on a weird day, today it's a pretty simple day actually. We're just going to do a uh, look at the test and I'm gonna make some final statements about cohabitation and then that'll lead into our next myth uh, for Tuesday and Wednesday. And then on Wednesday I'll give you um, a little bit of a Easter Holy Week prep and then um, just you know a few brief words on, on what to do uh, at home to prepare for Easter. Uh, but today, again, it's pretty simple. We're just going to look at the, the test results here and then talk uh, very briefly um, to kind of conclude our, our conversation on cohabitation and then give you one final assignment with that. It will be a, a journal reflection uh, that I may have mentioned uh, before. So uh, one other thing that I'm remembering right now, tonight, if you want to go watch the Saints play the Falcons in the first game back uh, to the Superdome, I think it's going to be on ESPN. And pretty cool, Mike Tirico, who was calling that game, I was at morning assembly at Jesuit uh, that um, that Monday, so he gave a, an address at Monday morning's assembly, and um, it was a pretty big deal. I guess you know for us it was just after Katrina, so it's kind of interesting that you know for our city we had just come back, um, and right now it's kind of a weird moment too, uh, and you know just some encouragement that our city you know will, will come back as well again. Okay, so uh, the test for the most part uh, pretty good. The average so far is about a ninety. 91, um, which is really good. There's a few that we're just gonna go through here real quick to, to say, okay, why did people miss some of these? Um, the first parts, I'm not really worried about. The, the discernment of spirits, most of you guys do really well on that. Um, this one is a tough one. Uh, this one came from that reading that I'm sure everyone read, uh, which is the idea that Pope Benedict was saying that even in the, uh, the face of doubt, um, no one can be completely secure in their faith. and this is the whole point of that that first part of the, the class we did is that whether you're discerning a vocation to marriage, whether you're discerning a vocation to the priestly life, whether you're asking the big ultimate questions, does God exist? Does he have a plan for me? The goal isn't necessarily certainty, right? That's not the goal of faith. And the Pope, Pope Emeritus, is saying in chapter one of his introduction to Christianity, the goal of faith is not certainty. It's not proof in the sense of like uh, demonstrable facts. The goal of faith is to see the world in a different way, to access this new reality or this higher reality through faith that lets you see the bigger picture for what it really is. I think you know you see that um, very clearly uh, during this coronavirus quarantine kind of thing, where you're having to find new ways to um, you know, participate in the mass or something like that, right? Like so, I'm watching uh, mass from home on Sunday. Uh, Father Tim, uh, the pastor at St. Catherine Santa, he just drove by in a, in a pickup truck uh, with the monstrance blessing everyone with the Eucharist, right? You're having to find these new ways to experience God, but if, with the eyes of faith, right, you realize like God is still very much present. If you were just to look at the surface level, you'd say, oh, the churches are closed, belief must be down or something like that. And that's clearly not the case. So that's what Pope Benedict's saying here. Um, the only other one in this section that I think we need to look at um, this is a tough one. This is one of the rules of discernment. When the evil spirit is acting like a licentious lover, what does Ignatius have us do? Um, it's the same thing that you would do um, in this temptation, right? Is that you, when you expose um, these kind of temptations and sins to the light, when you, you, know, you, you don't hide from them, you realize how ridiculous they are. Uh, and so when someone's trying to kind of like, you can almost think blackmail you, uh, when you expose that blackmail to the light, um, it doesn't have as much power. And so that's what Ignatius is getting at here, is that if you find yourself being tempted in um, the darkness, right, you, you get tempted when you're alone, things like that, uh, share that temptation with a friend, share it with a, a priest, a spiritual advisor, and you'd be surprised how quickly um, it goes away. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it in, in, in that section. Most of you guys did, did really well in, in that section, which makes sense, right? We had or I had a quiz on it. Um, finally, in the myths about marriage one, the only ones that I really wanted to uh, take a look at were things like this. Uh, this is kind of a trick question here. Uh, which of the following is used by the Catholic Church to break apart a previously valid marriage? 
The reason it's a trick question is that you you want to say annulment, but an annulment doesn't break apart a previously valid marriage. What an annulment does is it says a valid marriage never took place. All right, so there is no divorce or breaking up a marriage in the Catholic Church. Why? Because the Catholic understanding of what marriage is, by definition, not the Church's definition, not um, you know like some sort of asterisk or add-on to the base level definition. What it is is a you know eternal bond between a man and a woman who have come together in this comprehensive and exclusive union to be husband and wife and mother and father uh, to any children that they might have. And so there's no way to break it apart, right? And that's the idea, right? Is that um, it's not, I mean, it is a trick question, but the reason I ask it like this is to make sure you know or know that an annulment is not the same thing as a Catholic divorce. There is no such thing as a Catholic divorce, right? Now, that doesn't mean that there's not many Catholics who are divorced. That doesn't mean that there's not many Catholics um, who sometimes divorce civilly, right? Again, in the government's eyes, is actually a good thing, right? So think about, uh, you know, a, a family where maybe the father's abusive or is an alcoholic, right? It would be better for, you know, for the health and safety of the children that maybe that that civil union is broken up, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that covenant union is, and that's a tough pill to swallow, I think, for a lot of modern people. We're like, well, that doesn't seem fair. And it's important to remember that your vocation isn't always going to be fair. Uh, Holy Week is coming up. Christ dying on the cross is not really fair, right? It's not really fair, but it's exactly what God is calling him to. And through that sacrifice, the entire world is redeemed. Uh, the example I gave to you guys was uh, Graham Greene, whose uh, wife remained steadfast to him, even though he had many, 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 many affairs, right? They're like, well, that doesn't seem fair. Like, wh wh why doesn't she just break up the marriage, right? It's just, what is she getting out of it? Well, in the end, it's, it's her holiness that draws him back um, to honoring their marriage vows, right? It's, it's her holiness, it's her prayers that save his life. Um, so, you know, you never know uh, how God is working through uh, different people's lives to, to bring about uh, his plan. So that's, that's part of it too, okay? Just want to make sure you know that, though, about annulment and divorce. All right, um, only a few more here, and then we'll get to the essays. Let's see. Most of those are pretty good. That was kind of a trick one. Check all that apply. Um, I'll do pretty good there. Let's see. Okay. Which of the following statements best summarizes the relationship between happiness and marriage? This is the same one that we're going to talk about in the short answers that most people got points off for. So maybe we'll just combine it to make this video shorter. The idea is this, right? The whole reason we looked at preconception and common mentality, materialistic prejudice, is for you to say in all things, before I assume that I know the answer, before I assume that I know the way forward, let me reconsider it. Let me consider it in light of what do I already think about it in terms of actually thinking through these things and then why do I think them? Most people don't consider what they take to be the goal of life. Or you could say like, most people don't consider what kind of happiness they're actually trying to pursue in life. Some people really, really like to pursue um, competitive happiness, right? Uh, level two. This idea that I've worked hard for something, I've achieved it, I feel good about that. A lot of people like to pursue uh, happiness level one, right? It's really easy to get. Uh, you, you enjoy a really good burger, you enjoy a really good uh, pizza, something like that. But it's important to understand what you actually think happiness is before you get married. Because if you don't have the right definition of happiness, then even in your marriage, you might find that you're quite unhappy. Uh, in the sense that you either have the wrong version of happiness, which means that you maybe discern the wrong type of marriage, right? Contract marriage. Or you have um, the wrong view of happiness and you have a great marriage, but because your view of happiness is distorted, you, you're not even aware of how great your marriage really is, right? And that happens a lot of times with that midlife crisis uh, scenario, right? You're pursuing the, long, uh, the, the wrong type of happiness, even though your family life is great, but it twists the way that you see the world, right? So it's important to know why you think what you think about in terms of happiness as well as in terms of marriage before you go pursue either, right? Um, so that's why this answer uh, was the better one. Okay, and you can see most, of the, you know, it's still the most picked answer, but that it was one of the more missed questions, okay? And I think, oh yeah, here's another one. Um, this one, I don't know why we missed so many on this one, uh, but yeah, anytime you see the word desire, it's almost always going to be eros, right? Now, eros is not bad, 
it just it's not the only love right there's still agape philia right telos just means end goal or purpose that it's not a love okay um but i think that might be it yeah yeah same thing this is the same question so uh if you got both of these uh i feel sorry uh because you know i don't know how the computer picks them but it's basically the same question what, what's the best definition for eros you see that word desire there um that's what you're going to be looking for and then we're going to add in there that comprehensive unity that's a word for word from the notes though um i think that's it yeah so then here are our essays we already talked about the first one so to make this video a little bit shorter let's just move on to the second so most of you guys got full credit for this one again most most people got somewhere in the top uh, percent there of like seven to ten points but uh there's this one was more missed right most of you guys got this one right what i wanted you though wanted you to make sure that you knew um was that uh not just that the prenuptial agreement falls into the contract view of marriage, right? Um, and if you said that, you usually got like an eight and a half, nine out of 10, but that it's categorically opposed to the very good things of the covenant marriage. Um, so in other words, it's not simply, or I should say it like this, it's not just that prenuptial agreement falls into the contract category. It's that a prenup prenuptial agreement goes against what marriage is as a, as a whole. And I want you to be aware of that because of how ubiquitous prenuptial agreements are. Everyone just assumes you should get one. But it actually goes against the very skills and virtues necessary to have a good, holy, successful marriage. Um, so for instance, right, like if you were, uh, like you don't qualify a lot of things with your best friend. You don't say, I will be friends with you so long as, um, you know, I get to come over to your house and use your pool in the summer or something like that. You don't do that, right? Or you say, and then and if we stop being best friends, I will no longer um, allow you to, I'll no longer give you rides to practice. You know, you assume with best friends, like you just share everything and you're just there for each other and you feel like you can ask of them anything. Well, you would want that to be the same thing in your marriage, right? Putting some kind of agreement or terms before you're married, it actively goes against the covenant marriage. It actively goes against what it takes to have a good marriage. And so I just want you to be very aware of that. So if you added something along those lines, I uh, usually got that full 10 points, okay? And it was really interesting to see uh, what, what's the most interesting thing that you guys have learned so far. And a lot of you wrote something to the effect of like, uh, you didn't realize all that went into a covenant marriage, um, that you, your, your view of marriage was more on the contract view than you may have called the covenant view, uh, which is, is kind of interesting.